Hello, everyone, and welcome to Adobe Live on this uh, beautiful Monday morning, Monday afternoon, Monday evening, wherever you are joining from. My name is James Bonato, and I am joined by professional content creator and designer Jesse Showalter. Jesse, welcome to Adobe Live. Thanks for having me. Thanks, James. Uh, super excited to be here today. Absolutely. Super excited to have you. I know you've been around around the block a couple of times, but for those that are new to the stream in this sort of format, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, make sure to join the Adobe Live community, subscribe to the Adobe Live uh, YouTube channel. If you're over here on Behance, make sure to hop in the chat and uh, say what up, say hello to uh, myself and Jesse and ask those questions as we have an amazing stream today. Uh, and Jesse's going to be taking us through some uh, tips and tricks in Premiere, how to uh, you know scale your content, how to create templates, really, really interesting stuff. So you do not want to miss it. Um, and let me just welcome everyone as we're hopping in here. Sam, Annika, hello, Robert, Oliver. What is up, gang? Uh, always, always a pleasure to be here on Adobe Live. Uh, and with that being said, Jesse, I know you probably have a lot to cover today. And uh, I just want to kind of give you the floor to maybe introduce yourself to those who don't know you and what we're going to be getting into today. Yeah, sure. I mean, I guess, uh, you know, it makes sense for me to kind of explain why I'm here. And the reason I'm here is because I'm not a, a filmmaker. I'm not a professional video editor. What I am is I'm a designer who's passionate about creating content. I want to educate people, entertain people. And for me, the platform of choice to do that is YouTube. Uh, you know, James and I were talking before the, the stream started that I was years ago, like washing tables or like washing dishes, waiting tables and wanted to get into a career that I loved. I found design and I became really passionate about it, but I didn't have money to go to college. So I was literally like rocking an old version of Photoshop eight and reading design blogs. And I finally got to a place in my career where I was like, well, I want to help. Like there's, there's plenty of other designers out there who could be learning, could, don't even realize this is an opportunity for them. So I want to make content for them, but I hate writing. So it's like, I'm not going to blog. So video, I don't mind talking, so let's do video. And through that process, I had to teach myself video editing. I had to teach myself like about cameras, all this stuff. Um, and, you know, for me, like it's about the passion of creating and putting what you create out there. And you can really like, you know, video is a powerful medium. You can reach people, entertain them, you know, encourage them um, and train them. And so, I mean, I just think that there's tons of creatives out there. You may not be a video editor or filmmaker, but you can learn what we're going to be talking about today, which is building your own template, starting your own channel, and really starting to put your content out there and your creativity out there. So that's really my whole spiel. That's like my soapbox and where I come from. So what we're going to be doing today is along those lines is going in Premiere Pro and building a template. Because seven years ago when I started my YouTube channel, the problem I ran into was every time i sit down to edit a video i'm starting from scratch and the barrier to, to entry to get going was just so discouraging i was like oh here we go again and it was like i had to, i was refiguring out things every time different music different captions right. different everything until finally i realized it doesn't need to be this hard i'm making it way harder than it needs to be and and james you and i were talking about there's probably tons of people out there who want to start a channel or maybe yeah. who have started a channel and are struggling with being consistent that's where this comes in that's like really my strong suit is because when i started creating youtube content i it partially i wanted to like give back to like the design community but the other portion of it was i'm a really inconsistent person and this is a really great way that has like metrics involved cool. on training myself to be more consistent and the battle to get to consistency is really like what led to i'm super grateful and thankful i have like 300,000 subscribers today and that formula to get to that number to get to this place in life was really consistency over time yeah and without yeah. the consistency piece you're just not going to win on social media you're not going to win as a content creator and so today is all about building a template so that you have that that thing that will help you be more consistent um, cool, so cool. that's um, that that's and I love answering questions. I love talking, but that's really what today's all about. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I think it's it's gonna be a really interesting stream and, and thank you, Jesse, for kind of giving us that context and that intro because I do feel like for every creative, we're we're constantly in a flow of creative inspiration. And if we get hung up in the details of creating titles and creating thumbnails and creating like all the things that go into creating a YouTube video or content in that in in general. Uh, we can lose that inspiration very quickly. I, I speak from experience and I know that. I'm sure you feel the same way, Jesse, and I'm sure a lot of other people in the chat feel exactly the same. And so finding a template, which I know you're gonna walk us through today, 
and uh, a formula to let the formula kind of speak for itself and then have that inspiration continue to flow so that you can get your message out there. You can get your story out there more often, more frequently, and just build a community, which which you've done so well. Um, and yeah, I'm really, really excited to kind of see your workflow, your process. Again, as I mentioned, uh, for those in the chat, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, Jesse and I are here to answer those. Uh, I'm going to leave it to, to Jesse today, but if there's premier centric questions that anyone has, uh, has, you know, questions on, please feel free to ask. And, yeah. Uh, and yeah, please, uh, Jesse's YouTube channel looks amazing. The, th the thumbnails, are what I'm like immediately drawn to. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm I'm here to answer any and all questions. Like, if somebody just wants to go on a complete like goat path somewhere else and talk about thumbnails and schedule it and all that kind of stuff, I love talking about this stuff. But yeah, this is my channel. And one of the things I was just doing before we started the stream was I've I, I've put out 527 videos over the span wow. of these years. Um, wow. And when I did the math of it, that's consistently like eight point. 7.2 or something like that videos per month. So I put pretty much wow. consistently like eight videos a month. And sometimes that was obviously it's an average. Sometimes it was more, sometimes it was less, um, you know, but it's this, this ramp of getting to consistency that really like, I think is super helpful, right? Like quality is important. The quality of your content, the quality of what you're putting out there, but quantity does also matter, right? Algorithms yeah. care about quantity. They care about whether or not, um, you know, YouTube as a business is saying, do you like, if people like your content, are you going to have enough? Like, is it worthwhile for us to like feature you and kind of promote you? Cause if you're just going to drop off the face of the earth and make three videos a week for like a month or two, and then drop off the face of the earth, we're not really going to feature you. We're not going to like promote you anywhere to our, to our customers. Right. right and so right. it is about creating that consistency. So I even, I even like, uh, you know, I have something on my channel just says new videos every week, but there have been times when I've said expect videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you know, so it's about creating a schedule. And, um, and I, if I kind of just scroll through like a lot of these videos, like on my channel, all of them have a big old goofy, like image of me on it. So there's consistency there, but, all of these videos you're seeing right now, not a single one of them was like made without the template that I'm about to show you. So I guess wow. the cool thing is, um, you know, part of that consistency is not only the consistency for you, but there's a consistency of product for yeah. people who are watching your channel. They, they can count on videos coming out for me every single week. And they know that there's going to be a certain intro and certain things I say and the way that my videos flow. And if they like that, they're going to stick around and become a subscriber and then they can count on you. And so that's really a great thing. So I'm in Premiere Pro right now and there is a file for everybody to download. And it came with, in case you don't have your own stuff, um, it came with some free stock photography that I got from the YouTube royalty free, like um, music licenses section inside of YouTube studio. Uh, it has like a couple of like a few things inside of there, like a title and something else. Um, but really this is what my template looks like every time I open it. Okay. So cool. um, I'm just going to kind of drill in, take a look at a few things. Cause these are the things that are in the template that we're going to talk about today, which is uh, my template consists of music that's already there sitting on the timeline. I have multiple types of music. I have an intro music, and then I have a light background music that plays um, throughout the entirety of the video. And then I have like titles that are actually sitting here. You can see one of them like inside of the, uh, like the source window right now. And so I have like a main title for like the title of the video. And then I have like lower thirds and things you might need. I have a subscribe animation. Um, that I probably downloaded from Adobe stock. We'll talk about that too. <laughs> I probably snagged assets. So like, these are not things that I created, like some of them are, but some of them are things that I've downloaded and used. Um, so I have those always sitting on there as well. And then I have some little assets, like you'll notice, like anytime a video starts, I have these little like lens flares. It's just like mm -hmm. mimicking like light from the lens of the camera. Those are on top. And I use those to kind of transition between intro meat of the video and outro. So I just know that's like a thing for me. And then I have my kind of like intro animation thing. And this is something that I 100% downloaded and then tweaked to my liking to make sure it fit my visual branding and cool. then like put in my, like all of my stuff in it. So my channel is all about like design, UI, UX design, code and freelance stuff. So it's and just did like- you, Did you download those? Um also through Adobe stock or were those? Through yes, like I did. Yeah. So these are okay. Adobe stock assets that I downloaded Sweet. and 
Um, and, and it was really about grabbing it. It was a longer thing, but for me, I'm like, hey, I wanna get to the content quicker. So I cut it down and I just shortened it and did a little bit of editing inside of the template and then exported it out. And Sweet. so that's kind of one thing that I, I do think is really, really important is before you get to, well, let me say this, build a template that you can start using right now. But what the final process always, cause we'll go through my editing process later is always to update the template, right? Because your template will evolve. My template right now is like from the last video I put out on Friday is probably just like microscopically different from a video that went out like three months ago. Mm. It's because you learn and grow and evolve and want different things as a creative, as you're putting out your content. And so at every time I finish a video, I export that video, but I immediately reapply like anything that's happening there, like strip everything out of it and then export it out or just save that file out as the updated template. And gotcha. so there's going to be barely any change from video to video, but there will be some change between every like three to six months. You'd be like, oh, he's doing that a little bit different now. Cool. You know, cool. it's because I'm just kind of slowly tweaking and updating. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then uh, one of the things I always have, like also on my timeline is I have a, uh, a color correction layer that actually just sits on top. And this might be, who knows, for performance reasons. Like I said, I'm, I'm not the fount of all knowledge for video editing. I just know like this little bit, this little tiny much. Um, it might be bad to have a separate layer above. And I do color correction in my editing process on the video itself, but I always have this layer because stylistically it's going to just add that little teal and orange. Mine is a teal and orange, right. uh, like LUT that sits cool. on top of everything. And I just always have that there. The only difference might be depending on the lighting or something. I might actually go into the effect, the controls of it and just dial it back or dial cool. it up but it's always there for me to use. So those are the big things that are always in my template, which is music, the, the color correction, titles, um, and like my intro and outro piece. Also, uh, something that's very, very like YouTube specific is at the end of every YouTube video, you're able to drop cards and mm. different like other um, contextually related like videos to try to like lead people to. Yeah. So I have a method of, I have like a title screen at the end where my uh i'll shrink my video down so i'm talking here like on the cool. screen and then i can pop my little this is all internal now inside of youtube once you upload you can pop your little subscribe button up here which is your avatar and then i have space for two videos and so cool. yeah you can download those anywhere you can do it by trial and error you could just have like a big old picture of you like this on one side and then just make sure you have some space to throw some native youtube assets inside once you've uploaded the video Sweet. Um, um, I have a, I have a quick question in terms of production, uh, yeah. you know, like how you're actually shooting these videos, which I'm sure you'll get into a little bit, but, um, you, you know, with all of your templates being so consistent with your thumbnails looking consistent, even the lighting in your studio right now looks the way your thumbnails look with that kind of purplish, uh, background. Like, so everything feels like, okay, this is Jesse Showalter. Like we know exactly what we're going to get. Um, yeah. are you always shooting? um sort of talking head in the studio in the same way are you ever getting a little uh like working outside the box or is it better to just stick with the style that you have because people know you by that yeah so i think uh there's a couple considerations for that like for me i am pretty much like static inside of my studio here and i have two shots so i'm sitting right now at my desk and this is the same setup here where i have like a pc multiple screens i have a light like a key light up here and my main like streaming and desktop camera that's shooting here which is um, i shoot all sony stuff so this is one setup and this works for live streaming and for screen casting like like what's happening right now i'm going to do it an xd tutorial a photoshop tutorial i have this setup so i'm very very stationary here also i wish i could pull back and show you but i have everything on a large uh like tv mount clipped to the end of my desk that has a bunch of uh articulating arms so i can cool. just I can swing lights out, swing this microphone out, swing things out. And when I'm done with it, I just swing it all back and push it behind the desk and I can get back to work the way cool. I normally do. So that's Sweet. one setup. I also have another setup. My B setup it, where I do a lot of intros and outros is like kind of on this side of my studio, pointing back towards all this artwork that's on my wall here. And so I have the benefit because what I tend to do is design related kind of sitting at the desk, teaching you stuff. I'm pretty much static, but there are times where I, I will venture out and do certain things. Um, but I think that in, in those instances, like a lot of what we're going to talk about today is consistency and setting up SOPs, like standard operating procedures and systems and processes. It's like, 
if you can just create a system and process, if you're a vlogger, then, you know, boom, you like, you can create a system and process for you, which is always this lens, always these settings, always right. on this tripod that at least gets you a little bit of that way towards being consistent cool. and making it easier, right? Breaking down that frick right. barrier of entry. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Thanks. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to close this project uh, inside of Premiere Pro. I'm going to fire up a new project and we're just going to do it like pretty much from scratch um, because it's a pretty easy template to build. But before we do that, I'll talk about uh, just kind of like a few things like uh, administrative things. I, um, I usually work the majority of my assets and everything are held inside of a solid state um, uh, hard drive, which I have plugged in right now. And a lot of sometimes people ask me this about organizing like my files. So I have uh, a couple of extra things in here right now, but I usually keep like multiple years of YouTube videos like sitting here. So I have everything from like 2021, 2022, and now all the videos I'm starting to put out in 23. Awesome. And the reason I'll keep a couple of years, this is not all my videos. I have those like uh, archived on other hard drives if I need to go back to further years. But the reason I'll keep a couple of years here is because sometimes I need to pull in something that I've recently done or maybe pull in footage from, you know, multiple projects that are like have happened in the last few years. These are probably like my the most relevant things to pull in the last year or two. So my solid state drive works fast enough that I can do this and kind of operate off of it. Um, but for some people, you might want to just keep things local. That might work for you better, but I do organize things there. I also have a folder where I'm working new videos out of, and you can see all my templates mm -hmm. and everything inside of here, as well as new projects. And then I have like an assets folder that holds all of my stuff. And cool. that's where uh, Premiere Pro is actually linking and finding things. So gotcha. the majority of like, you can see I have uh, like an animation folder, I have a LUTs folder, music folder full of like stock or like royalty free music, sound effects, photos, everything. Like all that stuff lives in there and I'm always linking out to those things. So one of the things I always recommend is if you're pulling B-roll for videos, if you're finding stuff, make sure that's living all in one central place. And then what's really cool is you can always like, here's my little temporary template file just for today. Like you can start building a little bit of like a stock photography or, or like stock video repository. And that can just fire up like inside. And if you want to use, um, if you want to use like placeholders, like inside of your like Premiere Pro, Pro project to kind of like save some performance, you could do that. But it's just nice to have like, oh, I use that one a lot, right? Like, right so right. I like to go back and grab those things. So that's one thing yeah. I do. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's, um, that's such a key piece that I'll end up talking a lot about on different streams with people, the organization factor. And I think specifically for today and you talking about creating these templates, it's so important to have that stuff organized, especially if you talk about scaling, I feel like in order to scale, you have to dip back into your archives of things that you've done years before. Um, and it's, I have a very similar file structure, but it's really interesting to see the way you set things up because yeah. there's no one wants to go grab like 88 different hard drives when you want to start a project you always want one hard drive maybe a server or some backups that you can pull from so that you can get started a lot quicker yeah and i think there's you know like I, I could definitely be more organized you know in my like setup for sure there's always room for improvement there but i just think like as long as you are uh, part of this consistency thing is like as long as you're building a process building a process is a lifelong pursuit. Right. It's not like, oh, I figured it out. I nailed it. It's perfect. Because then I'll hang out with somebody like you, James, and be like, what do you do? Oh, I need to include that in my process and like right. add that. And right. so it's always evolving and you're always right. learning and growing with it. So I'm going to go cool. ahead and just start a new project. Uh, and I'm going to name this a really creative name, like templates. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> template be, V1, V2. Yeah, V3. it's going to be great. Uh, I'm going to put it inside of that template folder. Um, and then I'm just going to create the project. Um, I think I had one in there, but I'm going to replace it. So all good. And it's gone ahead and it's like importing all the stuff inside of the project for me already, which is actually kind of nice. Um, cool. and I'm going to delete this sequence. Actually, I'm going to close that sequence and I'm just going to start a new one. Cause I just want to start everything from scratch. So I'm just going to go file, um, like new, new sequence. And we'll build a brand new one. And I'm, I know a lot of people are like, get really nerded out here, but like, I, I just stick with the standard format for like 920 or 1920 by 1080. Um, and I'm going to name this again, the sequence, even I'm going to name template sequence. I'm going to pop that in and have a brand new sequence ready to go. And I don't know why my audio bars got so ginormous there, but um, okay. 
So from here, um, this is really where I'm going to start building. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in like, I, I do have some stuff, like some video from a project that I did. Um, and so I probably I don't know why it got all crazy in here and brought absolutely everything. So I'm just going to delete all this now. So this is what it probably should look like if you're bl like creating right. a blank template, should be totally blank. Um, but I do want to have that organization. So hopefully I'll be able to bring in music, stock videos, titles and assets like this and drag those in it gave me an error on something that's okay so i this is one thing i do is like i'll make sure that i have everything in there like in their folders in their respective folders because later on i want to be to i want to be able to dig in and say hey i'm looking for my music boom i have them in my right. subfolders super like and and these are once i save this template again those are always going to be linked out to that master repository where i can always find it um and i'm a hyper command s like save oh, guy yeah. so yep. you're gonna see me do that <laughs> why <Well, laughs> quite a bit it's just it's just who i am so i feel like if uh, there was like a time lapse on my keyboard when i'm editing it would just be my thumb and finger just going back and forth command s yeah, all day yeah so I, sometimes I sometimes i'll put uh like fast forward stuff like like you know uh time lapse stuff of me designing and you can see like just like the save thing happening like over and over and i've had people comment to me and say like yo dude chill it doesn't you know you're you're living in fear man but yeah yeah <laughs> Hey, well, everyone that's command S a million times has definitely lost a project or five in their uh, in their history of editing. So we know. Yeah, I like know I like that a project or five. That's like yeah. very, <laughs> very super good. OK, so I'm just going to bring in one piece of a, a video, but usually um, so you can see this is like my second setup here where I'm shooting long in my office and then I have my screencast like the same exact view that you're actually seeing right now. This is going to get really, cool. really meta, but here's me teaching some Adobe XD stuff. So I'm going to bring that in as well. Um, and here we go. So the first thing I'll do is I'll actually just open up and I just I need to get a sample out there like really quickly. So I'm just going to grab anything by hitting uh, like in and out inside of my source file. And then I'm real big on three point editing. So like in, out and period just to like slam it into the timeline. Um, and we'll get there later on when we talk about uh, editing and workflow and stuff. But I'm just looking for anything right now. And you can see like I shoot uh, it, I, I do have to do color correction on it. Like, so I'm not using like the color setting straight out of the camera, especially when I shoot with my like primary camera over there. So we'll fix that later. And this is like the best shot of me right now with the weirdest look on the screen. So <laughs> I don't know if you get a lot of those during like these videos. Oh yeah. Streets. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. And if people, if people join us right now, like that's usually what they see. They're like, Ooh, this looks, I don't know what's happening, but I'm down. I'm going to join. Yeah, I look very squinty eyed right now. I don't know why. So, so okay, are so, you real real quick before you get started? Sorry, Jesse, but are you yeah. shooting um, S log? Or are you shooting like a Rec 709 look? I'm shooting S log, okay. um, and I shoot Sony. So this uh, this shot you're seeing right here on like on the screen, it was shot with Sony A7 IV, like a new Sony A7 IV I just got. And then cool. the one that I'm shooting up here, like uh, on the stream actually, and for my desktop stuff, I'm shooting. Uh, I don't use S log up here. I do take the color straight out of it, and that one is uh, like a Sony. A6400, an older one, cool. Um, with like some Sigma glass on it. Um, nice. So, yeah, uh, my wife is a wedding photographer, so she shoots all Sony as well. So I get to sometimes borrow her stuff, and she borrows. There one. you go. Oh, hey, it's yeah. perfect. You guys share battery. You share life and batteries. That's it's right. Perfect. Yeah, we share all <laughs> things. So okay, so I'm gonna pop this on uh, the screen, and then I'm gonna go hunting, and and I, then I just start throwing assets in. Um, so I do have like a little bit more of like some hype music at the beginning of mine. Um, so I'm just gonna test and make sure. This is that's more of the chill stuff. And this is more of the the hype music. So I'm just going to grab a little bit of that hype music. And again, a lot of this is like about just initially getting stuff on the timeline. And then I start tweaking like actually on the timeline a little bit more. So I'm going to pull that audio like down here onto the timeline. And one of the things that is good, not only just like in the template, but good for consistency in general, is when you're doing YouTube stuff is uh, you have to think of it like a TV segment a little bit, right? Consistency mm -hmm. in the way that your uh, videos are like actually laid out it makes people feel like at home, like they can curl up with like, you know, some comfort food and be like, I know that Jesse's going to do an intro with a couple jokes in it. <laughs> and then it's going to pop in, it's going to zoom in, his intro is going to slam and then we'll be off and away to like the tutorial. So right, it's right. creating consistency in the way that your videos are segmented actually can, if you make this kind of content like me, directly match what your templates really like, uh, you know, resembling. Well, you're building, so, I mean, you're building a, a personality in a way, again, like going back to the idea of your community 
uh, a way for people to feel comfortable knowing exactly what they're going to get when they come back. You know, like yes. I, I feel like when I first started really getting into YouTube, it was right when I think Peter McKinnon was starting his channel and like the what's up everybody, like just became yeah. his, his thing. And I think I've seen so many other creators follow suit with finding that, finding their rhythm too, that is consistent. Yeah. I actually, I, I, I had, I knew nothing about Peter McKinnon because I'm not a photographer, so I didn't follow him. But for a while I was going like, what's up everybody? I'm just <laughs> at the start of every single one. And then somebody, I just kept getting comments like Peter McKinnon rip off, Peter McKinnon rip off. Oh. I was like, oh, what? And I You're looked like, it great, up. I was like, great for search. Keep it like, going. Okay. Uh, totally. That is kind of, so I ended up stopping. Um, but I do even have like similar things that I say, like at the end of each one of my videos, it'll be some variation of hope you're having an amazing week. Hope you're designing amazing things, making amazing things and something else that related to the video or that's happening sure. in the world right now. Cool. So it's like cool. those similar things or at the start of my video before, like my intro slams, you'll hear me a lot of times say, okay, because we're doing that, that, and that let's get started. And it's like, cool. It's like that soul food, that comfort thing where people are like, ah, oh, there it is. I like yeah, this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah, absolutely. Building that that brand kind of like identity, it's like so people can kind of like track along with me. So what I just did is I brought in the light leak as well. Um, and again, I'm not, this is like solid video that I'm gonna end up using blending modes to like pass through the video. I'm not even gonna touch it yet because right now I'm just dumping all the raw stuff onto the timeline. So we had first music, got a little piece of video that's hiding under here. Um, underneath this light leak. Um, I know also like the other music is going to need to come into play. So I'm going to, I'm just going to pull that whole thing and put it right there. It's going to come up. Um, and then I know what else do we need? What else do we need? I have a subscribe animation. So like that thing's going to come in eventually. We're going to like move everything around and put it where it goes here in a second. But then I also have my intro and I really do think, you know, so a little advice, like I think, I see a lot of people still having like really long, like what are you, you want to call it like a title blast or like an intro video or whatever it is. Um, they're still really, really long. Mine is like, I feel like still on the longer side, it's like five seconds. And I'm like considering like dropping it down because if people are watching stuff on YouTube, it's like a three second culture and they want right. to get to the value quick. So right. just advice to anybody watching like quicker is better. Um, Isn't that like, funny you, that five seconds is, I mean, cause years ago five seconds was very short and now that we're in a world of a second being too long on a real you know like a five second intro seems like it might drag on if it doesn't catch you enough so that's a that's yeah. a really good point yeah catch like uh catching people quickly is important um and you can even see like in some of my like videos uh, again this is the format that you see over and over there's probably an ad playing so we'll like we'll come back to that in a second but um it's the same format every time which is me presenting the content like back over here, like fade in. Oh, really another ad? Okay, YouTube, we'll do it. <laughs> we'll get back to you. <laughs> but it's like you fade in, like me explaining what the content's gonna be, like, and I'm trying to keep it under 30 seconds. Like I'm trying right. to flash some stuff that's coming up in the videos. It piques people's interest. And it's like actually an age old, like teaching thing. So you can see that lens flare that mm -hmm. happened at the top of the video. Like I'm talking about prototyping and testing. I'm making some sort of claim on what you're gonna learn in the video. I'm usually making a joke because that's my personality. Like, so <laughs> I'm throwing some B-roll in. I'm doing a lot of like, because I, I'm usually recording off of one camera, I'm punching in, punching out to try to keep people's interest because we're in this like short form content. There's the title, cool. like announcing cool. what the video is going to be. And somewhere around here, I'm probably saying, let's get started. And my, my intro slams. Sweet. So it's the Love same, that. it's that same format over and over. And so like knowing that, like also you can plan your content that way. And I always encourage people to do that. Like there's an age old teaching method that it says, uh, hook, took and look, and it's like hook the audience. Okay. Took, take them on a ride. And at the end of the video, look, ha have them look back and see what they learned. Oh, that's so cool. This, yeah. Hook, took, look, like, take right. them on a ride, like the whole thing. So it's, it is really important that you get their attention quickly in that moment. And you do it through what you're saying, uh, the value you're offering. It also does matter that you're bringing music and B-roll and different things to keep people's attention. Just TikTok has ruined us. It's absolutely oh, ruined us. I know. Well, I like the, I like the idea you, you said there too, about being able to structure your content too, by having a, a template and a format and being able to then it makes it probably easier for you to sit down and script out your video knowing, hey, this is my formula. This is what I'm sort of trying to follow. Um, I think a lot of the successful YouTubers like yourself and like some of these other people out there create that 
uh, template and then they build their story within it, even though it follows the same guidelines and it doesn't make yeah. it as overwhelming to sit down and be like, okay, what am I going to actually shoot and just open the camera to start recording because it makes your life a nightmare to edit. Yeah. That, that even like when we're talking about things like music, like when I used to like uh, edit a YouTube video, like I felt like I had to have new music every single time. So then yeah. I was spending like 20 to 30 minutes hunting down new royalty free music every time I went in to edit and it just started draining me. It started sucking like the motivation out of me to keep making YouTube content. And so I, I heard somebody, I forget where, just say like, nobody cares. No, nobody cares what music's playing in the background. You're the only one that cares. Like they mm. care that they might care that there is music, but just use the same one every time. And I went, what? Okay. Hey, like, so hey, like that's allowed. Yeah. I'm like, I didn't know that was allowed. Okay. And so if I, like if it took me 30 minutes every time to hunt down new music and I was making three videos a week, I just reclaimed an hour and a half of my life and that uh, like a week. And you do that like at scale over a month. Now I've reclaimed six hours of my mm -hmm. life. You do that throughout the year. Like you're talking, that's 48 hours of my life that I just gave myself back that I didn't need to be waste, like mm -hmm. wasting like mm -hmm. that. Now what you can do is like, the music that I've thrown on the timeline here, this is actually the music that plays in all of my videos right now. And it probably has for the last year, year and a half. Before that, I had other music playing for a year, year and a half. I took one day and said, I'm going to find some new music, like the fun hype mu intro music and chill music to play in the background. I found those two and then that was it. Like, so you can change things seasonally, but you don't need to be changing things per video. It's just right, right. outlandish, especially you're just not going to be able to hang. Yeah. Um, well, you're going to run out of music. You're going <laughs> like to run five, out of music with 500 yeah, song or 500 videos. You know, you're, you're constantly having to find something that feels fresh and new and it's just not yeah. going to happen. I'm not interested in uh, starting a career, like finding music for like featured films. I'm just not yeah. interested in it. That's not sure. my, that's not my vibe. Like my vibe right. is to get content to people and to use the tools at my disposal to, to get it out there. So, cool. all right. So I'm popping this in. Um, and then I do have like my outro screen. Um, so I'm just going to throw this at the end and we'll see like where it pops up later. Um, and I'm trying to think what other assets, oh, titles. Okay. So let's go back here and we'll look into, I might, sometimes I'll throw stock, uh, like music in there, but, or excuse me, stock, uh, video, like B roll just to have it. But like for now, it's not always a guarantee that you're going to use stock video, but I am right. a big fan. You'll see later on in, in my editing flow of having stuff on the timeline and then just duplicating across the timeline and dragging in and replacing, dragging yep. in and replacing. Right. And I'll show you how I do that. Cause I'm just like, I'm lazy. I'm real lazy yeah. when it comes to this stuff. Um, so are you, so are you using Mogerts inside of Premiere for any of I the, am. okay. Yep, absolutely. hundred percent. And so I can, I can show you a little bit about that right now. So sure. I'm going to come into like my workspaces. I'm going to go up to captions and graphics. Um, I've deleted everything out right now so that it looks nice and clean. I can come in here and just go to titles and I have a bunch of like kinetic titles that are like Mogerts and I'm just going to drag them in and load them. And again, like you're building a, a template here. So, I mean, I'm dragging in like 14, like different titles that you could potentially use, but you don't have to use all of them. I actually use like a max of three. So, you know, I would, if I'm starting out a template, I would drag these in. I would play with them a little bit and bring them out on my timeline and test them out and see if they're ones I want to keep. And if they are, I'm going to immediately star them and like favorite them. And then I'm going to do away with the ones that I don't need to deal with. And this sure. sounds like, I don't know, I'm a, I used to be a file hoarder. Like, I don't know <laughs> if anybody else is out there, like a program. I wanted every program installed. I wanted yep. every file always accessible to me. And then somewhere in the along the lines, I feel like I just became a minimal minimalist, like a digital minimalist where I was like, get rid of those. We don't need those. Right. Like, well, you kind of you sort of have to be in a way over time. And I think it just comes with the constant uh, need for a template for some sort of like style guy that's consistent and to save yourself time and, and headache of looking around and being like, I have too many options. So because I have so many options, I'm just not going to choose any of them rather than having like like three really good options that you can continue to cycle through. Yeah. And this is actually, um, I, I'm, I'm a designer. I do a lot of like web UI and UX design, but this is like a user experience design principle, which is don't cognitively overload people, right? The mm. cognitive load can be too much. It's the old, you know, mom and pop Italian restaurant that has 90 items yep. on the menu yep. versus the chic bistro that says, do you want the chicken, the fish or the lamb? You're like, so easy. I want the chicken every time it like, and you love that experience every time. Well, the funny thing is like, 
I'm the one that's responsible for making my experience inside of Premiere Pro. Like right. Adobe's offered me the tools. I'm the one that actually complicates it by adding in excess options. So by limiting the amount of options, it just makes it like such a breeze and actually a lot more enjoyable where I'm like, I know exactly what I'm doing here. Like yep. it's, I've limited my options. I've, I've practiced a little bit of self-control. Annika in the chat said, unless we're talking fonts, in which case I'm still a hoarder. I get that. I do. I, do. I feel like I that and I feel like Annika with fonts and Jesse, maybe you could talk a little bit about that and like how you chose a font for your brand, because to me, that's like one of the hardest things that I've I've chosen a font that works for our channel that I've been using for the last couple of years. And now my wife and I both really aren't loving it. And so it ends up outdating the stuff we've done previously. And so like, what are your thoughts on if you pick a font, do you have to re be religious to staying with that the entire time? Or can you is there flexibility in it? It's a good question. Yeah, like I'm probably one of the outliers that would say there's flexibility in it within means. I think that um, if you pick a type of font for your YouTube channel, which is a brand, it's your personal brand, right? That you're visually like displaying to the world. Um, my typography choices have always been strong, like thick, like sans serif, like font choices. And it's real easy to kind of just similar to my template, like slowly evolve it. That's actually okay. Um, cause I'm not like Coca-Cola, like where I, if people are going to be like, oh my gosh, the C is totally different. Like yeah, you freak yeah, out. Yeah. Um, but I do think of it a little bit like a brand where I'm like, Hey, I'm going to stay within the realm. I'm going to evolve the brand. I'm not going to all of a sudden turn into like a curly serif font. And like all of a sudden this Jesse Showalter's thing, it's consistent and similar enough that people might go like, oh, the type obviously a little bit different, but it's not, it's not so much of a change. And I think personal brands have that ability. Whereas massive like product-based brands don't necessarily so i think right. you can be playful as long as you're staying in the realm but i do think a, a, like a good thing to do is think about it like if you want to change stuff that is a little bit of a brand refresh or a brand overhaul so you should take the time and say hey you know we can't do a brand refresh yet it's only been six months that's a bad business yep. decision right uh, or right. otherwise we made a bad business decision before by refreshing the way it was right so if we're right. going to switch right. again we're going to have to wait and like use this current brand tone um, for a while and get some miles out of it. Mm -hmm. That's a good yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like uh, with a with a big brand like Coca-Cola, I mean, you spend millions and millions of dollars with an agency to create that. You're not going to everyone becomes accustomed to it. So you're never going to change it. So they I think a great example different. that could apply to like uh, personal brands as well, like on YouTube or wherever, is look at the Greyhound uh, like bus branding evolution. Um, they are Greyhound bus and it's just slowly evolved little by little, but actually if you hold up Greyhound bus, like right now, 2023, when, or versus, I don't know when they started, maybe in the fifties or sixties or something like that. Um, if you look up those two examples, they're pretty much still in the same wheelhouse. They're pretty mm -hmm. close mm -hmm. still. It's just a modern evolution of that brand. I think people like that. I don't think people like a complete switch and change. Um, that can be very jarring to people, especially in content driven companies, um, which I have a content company, like that's what I do. Um, people latch on to the person, right? Or to the people that are making that content more than they do the typography. So if all of a sudden I'm gonna start making content about, you know, like my favorite watches and I'm, I'm gonna try to be very serious and not like this. I like to crack jokes. I talk with my yeah, hands. Yeah. If all of a sudden I change, they'd be like, this is not, this is weird. Right. That's like, I, the this brand is what really I changing. That's really jarring. Gotcha. Like the color and typography that doesn't, it's not going to make as much of an impact. Cool. Yeah. Um, I'm, I really like, I'm really pr passionate about like creatives building their personal brand because, um, I really think it has massive upside um for creatives right now in this creative economy um I, I did a workshop recently teaching creatives how to build their brand and i found some really crazy stats like 70 percent of people would prefer to buy from a creative if they have a personal brand that's mm -hmm. like a consistent brand online somehow whether that's youtube content instagram stuff and 30 percent of companies would feel more comfortable hiring somebody if they have a personal brand. Wow, that's that's really interesting, yeah. Yeah, you have a 30% advantage over everybody else trying to get hired if you have a consistent personal brand because they can they can tune in, right? right. They can watch your channel, sure. they can see your process sure. and you've created that social proof and that trust simply by putting yourself out there consistently. So it's a huge thing right now. Everybody can do it and should be doing it. Cool, yeah, that's, well, I was gonna, as you continue to edit here, my question was gonna be, you know, in the landscape of, everyone 
wanting to be a content creator, you know, and the, the separation between those who are actually consistent content creators like yourself, Jesse, or the ones who, you know, are trying to be a content creator, but feel like there's too much competition and there's too much saturation in the market. Do you feel, I, I think you kind of answered that uh, based on, you know, if you have a personal brand that you stand behind and you have a, a, a personality, a story, all those things, people are more willing to align with who you are, not necessarily you talk about the same thing that somebody else might, but they align with you because of who you are. Yeah, I think there uh, people ask that all the time. They're like, is it, I feel like YouTube is really crowded. I feel like the space is really crowded. There's already like 10 or 20 other channels doing the thing that I like to do. And I'm like, yeah, but are they exactly like you? Right. Like if, right. if, if it's not you, like the, you know, the evil twin version of you out there who beat you to the punch, like you absolutely should, because no one thinks about it the way that you think about it. Nobody has the approach maybe that you have. And also like, there are ways for you just to say like, Hey, I, I like to talk about this thing, but in this specific way or with this specific niche. So there is room upon room. Like I am a design content creator. And I follow like at least 15 or 20 other design content sure. creators yeah. And, yeah. and not to like compare myself with them or do research because I just generally like watching other design content from creators. So there's tons of room. I mean, and I'm even more specific. Like you can see, I'm like UI design, UX design and code. I follow a bunch of other people just like that too. Like as well as different types, like, you know, graphic designers, illustrators. So yes, there's room. And... I have I have one follow up question to that. I know. Okay. Sorry, I'm throwing a bunch of questions your way as this you're editing great. here. I don't want you to to lose track of the edit, but I think this is important too. Um, so, in terms of so you're a a designer content creator, but clearly you've niched down a little bit in what you teach: code, UI, UX design. Like that's that's niching down into something that's a much larger. Uh, ecosystem. Do yeah. you find that that's really important? Like, so I'll give you an example for, uh, you know, us, my wife and I running a travel business. Um, we travel or we used to travel in the van full time and we were kind of in like the van life world. And we were finding that we didn't necessarily want to go full into that space because we weren't always going to be in there. But how important is it to continue to like niche down into your market? Um, or is it maybe better to find an overarching theme and then just like use your videos to tell those different stories. Yeah. Um, I think it could go either way, right? Like I know some people that are much more like personality focused and you just kind of follow them. I think at a certain point, people do want to have at least a bucket, a loose bucket of expectations to know that they can come to your channel and watch certain types. So that's travel and on your travels, you go rock climbing. You don't have to be a rock climbing vlog, but you just had an adventure, right? Cool. So it, it, I think having a clear mission statement and value statement as a creator can help you a lot. Um, I think if you want to be a generalist, whether it's doing design work or video work or, or whatever type of work or being a generalist in the type of content that you create, it can work. I think it's harder. I do think it's mm -hmm. harder. So I do think you need to figure out how to niche down just the slightest bit. Like I have a dear friend of mine who works, uh, I have two friends of mine, actually, they're both in the SEO industry. One is a talented SEO generalist. And the other one is an SEO expert for the wedding industry. That means she okay. only does wedding photographers, wedding venues, wedding planners. They're totally, they're two totally separate businesses that are successful. Mm. But if you type in you know, SEO for the wedding industry, like you're going to get one of my friends every single time. Like cool. you're going to find her every single time. Cool. And so it's about expectation, I think. So if you can, without killing your joy, niche down a little bit and pick some topics Sweet. and and kind of fixate and focus on those, you can. Now, what's cool is like, there's always room to evolve. After being consistent for a while, people will fall in love with the brand. People will fall in love with you and your content. If you want to start exploring new topics or areas within your brand you can and you just figure out whether or not they work or not you just gauge them and that's why i think you know not to harp on it too much but i am a youtube fanboy because there's metrics built right in there and they're super targeted mm -hmm. i know that like when i started my channel i was kind of interested in vlogging everybody was vlogging at that time i really wanted an electric skateboard couldn't afford one so i just <laughs> vlogged without one you know that's that yeah, was gonna yeah. go for it but i realized nobody really wanted to watch my vlogs i don't know why and so but people loved when I did design work or talked about freelance or coded websites. And so I was like, all right, I love doing those things. So I'm just going to take cool. the feedback and give cool. the people 
what they want to see. Sweet. Now, if they would have said, we really wish Jesse would do cooking shows, I'd be like, well, I can't, that's not going to be me. Right, right? right. I can't compromise who I am or what I love or change to be somebody I'm not. But within the things that you are, you can find the things that people latch onto and love and you can kind Very of cool. like leverage those i think sorry that very was cool. a really long-winded version no that's okay that's all right that's <laughs> very very useful information okay so quick update on what i'm doing right now i'm just kind of resizing things generally like i have uh i took my like light league layer and i just did a little bit of like effect control by um adding a blend mode of screen and then dropping the opacity of it down to 60. um i have my content or my like actual subject matter or video sized correctly um one thing i won't really do because just because of the tech and everything right now on stream is i won't really talk about like balancing music um but just quick note you want to make sure that it's not blaring and overwhelming like the talking obviously so that's pretty easy stuff but i'm then i'm just kind of positioning things like in place so sizing everything correctly um you know i usually subscribe like i'll have that subscribe shrunk down from its original version and tucked up into a corner because if i was to bring over content you can see it should be left or right of my head. And this might be a really good time to talk like, do you want to shoot dead center? Do you want to shoot rule of two thirds and kick yourself off to a side? Um, I think I have read some studies that say it's better to shoot two thirds and then put the subscribe on the right hand side because natively in YouTube, subscriptions happen on the bottom right. I know some people will even say the closer you can actually get that subscribe to where in the viewer that they subscribe, mm -hmm. you should probably do it there. But it's, I think to each his own. Um, just, I obviously don't want to cover my face with it. And then I have my title in there in case, uh, and I'm just kind of like viewing the title to see how it looks. So that's looking pretty good so far. And then the next thing I'm going to do is um, I'm going to bring a little bit of like test video or sample video over here. And YouTube is very specific. It's up to, I'm going to blank right now, either 16 or 18 seconds um, to have like an end scene where people can click and subscribe and see the cards for your other featured mm -hmm. videos. So I'm going to bring in my, uh, my end screen here. And um, I'm just going to roll this back. And then I like to just drag it out because you can actually see the duration of the video here. So duration of, we'll just stop at like around 16, like that. So 16 seconds. And then I always have, and I, I'm not going to do this in the template, but I'll keep this in the template. But I would always, you know, the video is playing, playing, playing over here. Right around this spot is where I'm going to, at the start of my end screen, I'm going to come in and just position and scale. And I'm going to create some keyframes up in my effect controls. And then I'll just give it a like maybe 20 or 30 like frames to the right. And that's where I'm going to shrink it down hmm. and then just move it over to the side like this. So as you're, as you're watching the video, it's like, this is the end of the video. The end music has kicked in. It's kind of deep showing you that. And then it just kind of zips down. Cool. And now natively in YouTube, I'm going to plug my subscribe there and my videos here. It's just a nice experience for people. It feels I mean, YouTube did a great job. They know what they're doing their YouTube. It feels very much like a produced show. Sure. Um, but when when I was first starting YouTube, I actually didn't know that. And I just native, I put the videos, like the re recommended videos inside of my timeline and popped them in there. And I was like, I don't know how people are going to click on those. How do they do that on YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, after I uploaded one video, I was like, oh yeah, I don't put those in there. Okay, good to know. That's, well, that's a, that's a huge uh, tip that, you know, I've never even, uh, I'll normally adjust the end cards, um, inside of YouTube using, um, TubeBuddy, like a third party plugin that I, that I'll use to position either like the best video for the viewer or one that I'll yeah. like customize, but I don't have anything like you've created here, which I think is such a wonderful UI experience. Obviously it's what you do for a living. So you're good at it. <laughs> um, but I think that's really cool to have as a way to rather than when people reach the end of the video, forcing them out off of yeah. the platform you're keeping them in there you're giving them some more information and then you're hopefully driving them to another video yeah and you know you want to do that like the reason i like to do this is because i don't want it to just end like me talking and it just ends and then there's 16 seconds of music playing and the videos are there i'd rather combine the whole thing together so it feels like an integrated experience and i am because i'm a web designer as well i am cheating a little bit so there is the z reading pattern which starts usually top left when people are looking at things online it z's over to the right and then it comes back down to the left ah. and so what they're seeing is like subscribe and my name associated with subscribing that's the first thing i want them to do is subscribe as they z over they can see the guarantee there that they come back there's going to be videos for you every week and as they come down their eyes catching like these two videos that are in place 
as they Z back down, right? So it's a little bit of that standard like web reading pattern that I'm trying to like utilize and leverage, um, but at the same time, not just allowing the videos like or the the suggested content to speak for itself. I'm there going, hey, make sure you subscribe, come back, follow me, do this stuff. Cool. It, cool. it feels like an integrated experience for them. And have you noticed a difference? I mean, I imagine you have since this is something that you're using as a template, but over the years, have you noticed a, a difference like metric wise in terms of just viewership yeah. going up because of doing this? Yeah, there's so a couple little YouTube hacks, like if you want to stop and talk YouTube hacks for a second and get off and get off from your pro, but um, like a few things are like the major drop off time, like when you're watching YouTube videos, doesn't matter the length of the video, it could be hour, it could be a five minute video, is that first 30 seconds to minute and a half. So um, you want to, uh, if you're like, man, I don't have time to do a lot of excess editing, like B-roll and other kind of like creative things. If you're gonna prioritize it, you wanna prioritize all of that stuff towards the front part of the video. Mm -hmm. So you're in keeping people engaged. That means jump cuts, B-roll, like funny moments, whatever it is, you kind of wanna be doing a lot of that in the first minute and a half to keep them engaged. Also, cards are another thing native in YouTube. Those are those little things that kind of slide out on the screen to say like, hey, this video, right. it's best if you can match up what you're saying, like, hey, yeah, like da, 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 da. like that's a standard web design thing. Hey, there's a card up here you can touch if you wanna like learn more about that. But if you don't have anything specific you're saying in the video, again, it's good to keep those cards at the front half of your video because you wanna give the user as many options as they can before they hit that, that standard cool. kind of like decline where people log off and stop watching your video. So give them lots of options. Cool. Um, and then if you can keep people engaged throughout, really it's the reward system at the end um, if you can have something that is rewarding, like an end screen with other options there for them, you're going to see an uptick also in whatever you're offering them. And again, this is back to the the minimalistic thing. Less is more. So you don't want to offer them like tons of things at the end, one, two videos. And if subscribe to you is important, then you can. I've seen some people argue that if they haven't subscribed yet, they're not going to. So don't put it there and give them even less options. Mm -hmm. But even less options is better, right? Like when Netflix, like an episode on Netflix is ending, they don't say, hey, did you like that episode of Last of Us? Maybe right now you'd like to try these seven shows. They go, right. next episode's coming up in five seconds. Right. That's all and, they do. Yep, yep. It's the simplicity of one option. That simplicity wins out every time, right? Cool. So yeah, and not to try to tie it up too neatly in a package, but back to Premiere Pro, back to the template, simplicity wins and consistency wins every time. That's why we're building a template. Awesome. All right. So I'm just like, at this point, like my, my template is like partially built. I have all the main components in there. Like what I would do next is I would start actually bringing stuff in and I would use this template to build my first video because nothing's going to be quite perfect, right? Nothing's going to be quite set until you actually start giving, getting some real content inside. So I'm going to start moving into my, like just editing workflow. And then if people have questions about how I edit or, or anything else, um, feel free to ask those too. Sweet. Awesome. So I'm just kind of scrubbing through a little bit. And again, this video is not going to be like super perfect, obviously, because I don't, I don't really care if the timing is right. Cause you can't hear it. But, um, one thing I'm going to do is just kind of move my timeline up. Ooh, that was wrong. I'm going to reset my workspace because I just messed up my workspace. There we go. That's much better. And so one, one of the things I'm really, really big at is, um, and I'm not doing it so much here, but in a standard video edit, I am doing, I am, I use workspaces like quite a bit. So I'm using like an import workspace and then like organizing that workspace. And then once I'm getting into editing, I'm making sure that I'm using the proper one. So um, I use the assembly workspace like quite a bit because this space here is like so really, nice. really like, yeah, it's super nice for me, especially like a lot of times I'm uh, editing um, on a PC in like Premiere, in, like on a PC using like a 34 inch monitor, which is great. But sometimes when I'm on the road doing stuff, I'm like, I'm using a 14 inch MacBook Pro here today. Right, right. I need that space. So it's, it just, just for me, I'm like, just know spaces are super crucial uh, because it'll keep you from going absolutely crazy. So that's like my assembly workspace. Then I'll move over to editing and I do this kind of like two part editing here, like where I have my source monitor here, my actual like uh, main video on the right. And then I'm a big proponent of three point editing, which is. Um, you could probably explain it better than me, which is basically just having your key, your hands on like the keyboard. Um, I keep them usually around J, K and L so that I can like reverse 
like stop, play forward. And right from there, I can then hit I for in. And then as the video is playing and I find the clip that I want, I can O for out. And then I'm just hitting, you know, I'm making sure I'm on the timeline in the right spot. I'm hitting period and I'm just inserting that video and dumping it right into the timeline. Yep. So this is yep. like my, my workflow is get all the rough cuts of everything from the video onto the timeline first. So this is me just three point editing in there, find the right spot out, you know, pausing and hitting like period, get it in. And then I'll hit shift O to go back to the end. Cause sometimes I'm like, I'm eating Doritos and like doing stuff real fast. And I'm like, oh, I missed it. Shift O, get back to the out spot. And I find the new one and boom, again, bam, slam them in. So this is me going now. That's the first part is like getting everything on the timeline as such. So I'm going to pretend like uh, what I've done is like uh, found like the intro of the video. I'm going to pretend like that's the case. Um, so we would have like a light leak coming in here and I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit so we can see some more. And I'll just pump this up so we can see this audio as well. Yeah, we talk we talk so much about uh, keyboard shortcuts just in every Adobe program and Premiere and After Effects and anything motion related. I mean, just to keep your hand on the keyboard, like you said, um, yeah. is so important for time. You know, you talk about templates saving time, but I think keyboard shortcuts are often overlooked for people that are new to using Premiere because they're just not familiar with how things work. Um, and yeah. I've mentioned this before, you know, like setting up those keyboard shortcuts to work for yourself, the way that you have yours set up might be different than somebody else's in the stream, but all that matters is you can customize them to make them feel like they work with your long fingers or short fingers or whatever, whatever yeah. works on the keyboard. Um, because it really, really saves you time and it makes the, the process so much more enjoyable too. Totally. Also that and customize, like customizing your workspace, the same thing. Like you can see, I was just closing a bunch of windows that I'm not currently using. Like I don't need music open right now. Um, I don't need my assets open right now. So I'm just minimizing everything. I'm really big about having like effects sitting right here. Um, and then having like my effect controls, my source monitor open and trying to keep my hands on the keyboard. I think there's probably people who have like this massive like memory of like all the short or like the key commands and everything in Premiere Pro. But those three point editing ones for me are huge. Um, knowing how to um, like get to certain tools, like being able to cut on the timeline with C, um, hitting Y so that I can, I always forget the name of this thing, slip tool. So I can like slip the, the video like backwards and forwards if I need to like that. Um, those are big ones for me. And then like back to V for my pointer tool. Um, and so uh, one thing I'll, there's a same thing. Like there's a couple of like effects in certain things that you have to experiment with. If you're not used to using Premiere Pro and making YouTube videos, um, like one of them is like, like crossfade. I know I'm just going to search for it. I'm going to find the audio transition for crossfade. I'm going to drag it into my music. So it kind of comes in kind of gently. That's a big one for me. Um, but I have certain ones that I always go to like crossfades, 3d transforms, maybe a few others. I just know those are mine. And I'm, I, I'm trying to always stay open and watch other people's streams and what they do. I'm like, oh, maybe I could implement that. But for the most part, to stay consistent, I try to just stay with what I know and right. cruise with it until there's a need. Uh, if all of a sudden I'm like, this isn't working anymore, I can do this better, then I go out hunting. But I used to be the person that was just constantly hunting to find new ways of doing things. And I'd be like, oh, okay, there's this crazy key command to do this crazy thing. And I'll use it once a year. But I spent like, I wasted all this yeah. time learning it and it's just well, not part of workflow. I feel like it takes a lot of, um, what's the word? Like dis it takes a lot of discipline to not let the fact that there are so many tools inside of Premiere and inside of After Effects uh, not to overwhelm you, you know, to be like, okay, yeah. I, this, this works well for me. This is what I like to use. I'm just going to stick with this, even though I can use all these other tools. And even if I see other creators using those, that doesn't necessarily mean I have to. So it doesn't, it in no way hinders your ability to learn those. It's just for your workflow. And again, like you had said to, to create content at scale, which is what you're talking about here today. It's mm -hmm. so important to have that discipline of like, okay, these are the tools I like to use. I'm going to stick with them for now, yeah. you know? Yeah. Another, and that's like another shout out to like Mogurts, right? Because like, at first I was like every title that I was going to make, I open up after effects, create custom titles, export them out and then bring them in. And I was like, yeah, that's cool, but it's taken me forever. So I found like finding the pack of motion graphics templates that work for you on something like Adobe stock or just building them and being able to somehow reuse them or creating the Mogurts yourself. 
whatever it is, like just figure out a way to do it at scale. Because yep. I don't know, like I'm, I'm wondering what's normal. I'd, I'd like to ask the chat question right now. Like if you're going to sit down and then and edit like a talking head video that's going to be like eight or nine minutes long. I'm wondering what the expectation would be, like how long they would anticipate that project would take them. Because when I mm. first started, it would take me multiple hours. Like it would take me like three, three and a half hours to edit that video. And now with the template, the key commands, having everything built in already, I can edit that eight or nine minute YouTube video in like 30 minutes, like 30, 40 minutes maybe. And like, I'm done out the door. Mm, so that, it's, a, yeah. it's a good feeling to know that I can actually shoot and edit and like export and have it up on YouTube kind of in the span of an hour and a half or two, as long as I've had my script and like the rest of my stuff together, I can like, I can produce quickly. That's but, incredible. That's really, yeah. I mean, cause I don't, I know, I know I can't do that even though if I find myself in a flow, just using, just using me as an example. But again, if there are people in the chat that have a similar feeling here, um, my hang up is always, well, I have this template that I created for this video, but I kind of want to experiment and try something different. But in doing that, I'm then making myself anxious thinking about, well, that itself is going to take me longer than editing this talking head video. Like I can, I can edit a talking head video just as quickly. It's just the, the, the formatting of the whole style. So that's amazing that you have found yourself in a place where you're you know, two hours tops to create these videos. And I think it shows because you have so many videos posted and you're able to scale because of what you've done. And I, I think there's totally an argument to say like, well, you know, like, but your content could be better, right? Like I totally, like if I spent way more time, I could put way more effort into the edit, but then I, it's a balancing act. It's okay. Like I need to balance, constantly be balancing quality, quality of content, quality of script writing, quality of edit with quantity, which is, Hey, like it, I know there's a couple of channels out there that put out one or two YouTube videos a year, but they're like, and they get like 10, 15, 20 million views on a video, but it takes them all year to shoot right. and like produce like those videos. That's a different plan than me saying, you can count on a video from me every Monday, every Wednesday, live stream every Friday and the reels or, and like Insta or YouTube shorts and Instagram reels that come off of that long form content, you can expect that Monday through Friday. So I have shorts that come out Monday through Friday as well, like on top. So it's just this mm. constant train of content that people can depend on. Mm. Um, so it's just a different game plan, right? And I could totally up the quality, but it would down the quantity. So it's like right. figuring out what right. works best for you. And I've, cool. over the years, I've found that this is the happy medium for me, but that's just, that's just my vibe. It could be totally different than somebody else's and that's okay. Um, and the tricks that I'm uh, like, I think probably that I'm showing today probably really pertain to what I am trying to accomplish, which is partially some of that quantity. So um, like I'll, I'll do three point editing, like to a certain extent, but then sometimes I have things like screencasts where um, like, this is an example of me doing like an XD tutorial where um, I'm sitting at this desk, I'm shooting it all at once. And I know me because of like my, how long I've been using XD or how long I've been doing UI design stuff. I'm going to have very little slip ups. So one of the workflows I do is I know that if I'm doing a screencast, I don't have to do three point editing here. Like I know that I can probably just hmm. make some space on my timeline and just bring this whole thing onto the timeline. Um, and one of my tricks that I, <laughs> that I make sure to do is if I do mess up, I'm just going to pull like a really long pause. And the reason I'm going to pull that pause, like I'm going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to stay quiet for like 15 or 20 seconds, take a breath, grab a drink. I'm still filming. Everything's still rolling. And then I'm going, okay, I got my stuff together. I'm going to redo that piece and keep, keep going. And then I just mark the time mm. and I push back in because I know that when I see long pauses on my timeline like this, right, that was, know. that was me. So now I know I can just come in. I don't even have to like check it. I just know that was a problem right there. And I mark it, I delete it. And then I, all I have to do is come back and check for the spot where it was, maybe I slipped up a little bit, which was maybe right around there. I delete it. I click in between. I click, like uh, I do an option delete just to like like pull the like the clip in, and then I'm I'm cruising. I'm looking for more mm -hmm. blank gaps on my mm -hmm. timeline. So this is like a really fast way, especially with long content, where sometimes I'm doing 15, 20, 30 minutes. I'm gonna walk you through how to build an app from start to finish, 
that's a lot of three point editing where yep, like, yeah. out, slap in out slap versus being able to look at it at scale. Like there's another, there's another mess up. I just know. Cause like, that's been my process I've set up, give myself that gap, cut that gap out, come back and find the spot where the mess up first happened. Boom, delete them and move on. Cool. And so I think, I think, uh, I think another big key there too, Jesse is, um, for, you know, for those in the chat and those that are watching this, like you've been doing this for, you said over seven years and you've probably yeah. been a designer for a lot longer than that. And I think the consistency of you being a professional doing this for so long has, uh, trained you to probably record these videos a lot quicker and like tutorials talking to the camera a lot quicker. Cause yep. as you know, like speaking to the camera is not the easiest thing to do when you're by yourself, even though people think maybe it is. And so that takes practice in itself and you have to it sort does. of hone that over time. And as you go, um, I'm wondering if you can, you can tell a difference from some of the earlier videos you shot, you know, seven years ago to, uh, the refined voice that you have now. Oh man. It's I I'm actually like, it's on my list of videos to like put out soon, which is just a like cringe reaction to like my very first video or two, because I think I, I, I I've always been an extrovert. I've always talked with my hands. I always, I love design. I'm passionate about it. I could talk about it anytime, but for some reason, the first time you like open up a camera, it's terrifying. Right. Like yeah. you don't know, like it's, you just don't know how to talk. You don't, I didn't even sound like myself. I feel like, cause that's right. how nervous I was about the whole thing. I was nervous about what other people were going to think of me. I was nervous about how I was going to look on camera, all of those things. And I think that everybody in the process, if you're going to start creating content at scale, one of the first puzzle pieces to figure out is hurry up and film and produce and publish your first 10 yeah. videos. Yeah. Because those are the videos that nobody's going to watch. Like, right. If you're just starting a YouTube channel from scratch, let's say nobody's going to see them, but yeah. that you're going to start building momentum, momentum of like how you get adjusted to the camera and how you start to become more of yourself. More people will start watching, but I have, like I said, over 500 and something videos on my channel. That first video I put out still has like six views. And I think my mom watched it five times, you know? So like, <laughs> it's- Well, it's, you no, that's but, almost, those videos are almost more for you than they are for anybody else. Like they're- They are. They're there to, as practice, which you have to put out because you need the, yeah. you need the feedback. You need, you need to then watch it years later and say, wow, I've uh, grown as, an artist I've grown as somebody t speaking to the camera and I can even look back at th things that I did years ago and realize, wow, like I sounded very uncomfortable and I, I didn't feel as confident as maybe I am now. And, and I think that's, again, that's, that, as you said, that's just an evolution of, um, being consistent and continuing to, to sort of hone your, hone your craft. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, what's cool is the evolution uh, matches the processes you'll put in place, right? Like you'll evolve as the person talking to the camera, you'll evolve your processes editing inside of Premiere. You'll evolve everything. And, you know, 2.0 of you will be very, very different than the 1.0 version of you as you're creating content, right? Like, right, right. And it's, it's healthy, like, at, especially as creatives, we get really caught up with imposter syndrome. We want it to be the right thing. I have a, a friend of mine, um, I've been in a mastermind for like the last like four years. And I have a bunch of friends who are starting to make content. And uh, one gal who just joined us and like became part of our group, she just put out her first YouTube video like the other day, but she told us like, I deleted like six videos. I, I refilmed <laughs> it six times before I put it out. And I'm just encouraging her, put, put the next six get out. out. Yeah. Every time you make it, just put it out and don't care. Right. Cause you have to get through it so that you can start to understand what works and doesn't work. Right. Even to understand like how much you enjoy it or what you might want to tweak because I, I love making YouTube videos, right? Like, but I wouldn't have known that had I not got in, I play, I like, I play instruments. I play guitar. I have okay. a bunch of guitars over here as well. Um, and I've taught a lot of people how to play guitar. And the, the hardest thing is if somebody wants to learn how to play guitar, but they won't commit to the practice because it's too hard. They'll never get past the part of it where it's hard, where they start realizing, oh my gosh, I know how to make music. Oh yep. my gosh, I know yep. how to strum six strings yep. and create something. And I just had to learn the tool to do so. Yeah. You know? Well, I, uh, I can, I can definitely agree with that. I started playing like two years ago. I played in high school, but I, again, I was never consistent and I just like noodled. And then I'm like, like, I really, really want to try, like actually try this. And, um, I, it's the one thing even more than 
filmmaking and video editing that I've dedicated at least an hour every day over the last two years to. And I can absolutely see a difference in just the fact that my wife wants to sit in the room and listen to me play now instead of like, <laughs> please stop making this noise. So right. I, it's a, it's a really satisfying feeling, which you definitely feel in, in creating what you're creating, knowing, Hey, like hard work does pay off, um, at a certain point, if you just keep, you know, keep at it. Yeah, I think, and there's there's times and places for it, right? It just depends on like what matters to you. So like, I play a lot of instruments, uh, but my kids recently, I have two kids and they started learning how to play violin and cello. So wow. we rented a violin and a cello and I was like, I wanna learn how to play cello too. So, you know, I was like, this will be great. I'll dedicate like an hour every day to cello. And I got like, I got like three weeks into it. I was like, nah, this doesn't matter that much to me. I'm not gonna learn. <laughs> Right. Like, so I can't, I can't, you got to pick and choose your battles, but I think sure, I sure. really think that if you're a creative and you want to create a personal brand and open up tons of opportunities for you, creating content online is a battle you should pick. It's a yeah. and it may feel like you'll get really discouraged at times. And you're like, ah, this battle's not worth it, but I think it I, I think it really really can be. Um, so what I've done now is like I've just shown like an example of like bringing like not only that three point editing and gotten those things on the timeline where it's needed, then doing the long form and my, my process of leaving gaps and knowing where to edit those things out. That's what I would call like my three point editing. I do my timeline editing and then I'll go back through and do the next step is like a timeline polish. So that's where I'm like going to zoom in and just make sure that like, if I have ugly spots on my timeline, you know, maybe this, this portion was like three point editing. And I just kind of, I didn't get it like quite perfect. I'm just going to make sure that like by scrubbing through and like testing it a bunch, like, oh, okay, right there is actually where that should cut. And I'm going to clear that marker out. I don't need that. Um, and, you know, maybe like this was like a little whoops right here at the end. I'm going to clear that out. And then I'm just going to make sure that I polish like through the entire timeline. So that's, that would be like the next step in my process would be like a timeline polish of everything. Um, and so similar to the way that I batch everything within my editing process, I also batch like shooting videos too. I'll never shoot one video at a time. So that's one bit of advice that people or question that people have and advice I always give, which is never film less than two videos at a time. Um, because the time and the energy and effort to, you know, get dressed the right way and set up your lights and your microphone. Yep. And then you sit down, you film one, you put everything away and you edit that one. It's like, we need to get back to that Henry Ford, like production line and bulk, you know, shoot, bulk, edit, bulk, upload. Mm. You should just try to batch everything as much as you possibly can. So are you, um, along the same lines, are you, when you're batch creating videos, especially since you're releasing content Monday, Wednesday and Friday, will you edit three or four videos like on a Monday? And then will you schedule that content out for the week? So you're not necessarily, every single day at your computer editing for the week, you're just doing it maybe like once or twice in the beginning of the yeah. week. Yeah, so um, at a certain point, I started offloading some of the editing to, I have an editor that does maybe like 50%, but I still do 50% of my editing because I'm, I'm maybe like a little, I have control issues. So <laughs> I still I still like the process like of editing yeah, a little yeah. bit and it keeps me involved. And sometimes I'll do stuff and my editor will be like, oh, I really like what you did. I'll adapt that. I go, great, thanks. And sometimes he does that and I go, oh, that's great. So it's nice. It was nice to finally, after like five years to branch out and have somebody like an outside source kind of be helpful. But when I edit, yeah, I will. Uh, um, I'm usually about a week and a half or two ahead in my content schedule. So I have a content schedule. Those are planned out like probably two months in advance, but then shoot like production of everything is happening a week and a half or so in advance. Hmm. So I'll shoot like four videos on a Monday and then, you know, I, I do obviously other work and stuff like that. But then like when Tuesday comes, I'm probably editing, I'm editing two of them. My editor is editing two of them. Cool. And then on Wednesday, I'm bulk uploading everything. Um, so that means I have everything for the following week done. Um, Sweet. And then when the following, then I'm maybe if I have to do any tweaking or scripting or planning, I'm planning that. And the following week, Monday, I'm batch like recording again, mm -hmm. batch filming mm -hmm. again and doing the process again. But it doesn't take up, none of those days are like full days of YouTube creation because the more that you, like the further ahead you can script or outline your videos, the more you know the content. So the less mess ups right. you make. And right. so now right. you're like being way more like, like efficient just by setting time like aside and having a schedule. So back to the consistency thing, like your internal production schedule 
can actually make filming faster, can make editing faster. Cause the less mess ups I have in filming, the less or the easier my editing is the, just the easier everything goes. So mm. just procrastination is like the death of, of the process for sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Hey Jesse, I just wanted to let, let you know, you got about 10 minutes left. So if there's oh, things gosh. here in okay. premiere that you want to get to before we wrap up, um, yep. And again, if there's anyone in the chat that has other questions for Jesse, while we still have them here on the stream, please let me know. Um, I've been learning a ton and I've been hogging the questions. So please, anyone in the stream. Uh, um, right now, I'm just throwing some B-roll in. And one of the considerations I always think about when I'm doing B-roll is um, a lot of times, like obviously I want the B-roll to like match the spot, but as I'm editing or like the specific content, but as I'm editing, I'm also thinking about like, you know, do I want it to be like such a, a harsh cut from one piece of like video to another, or maybe I would rather have it jump cut to some B-roll and then by the time you come out. So sometimes I'm, I'm thinking about B-roll, like strategic spots to cover cuts that I didn't like or certain things. So the next step in my process would be coming back through and adding B-roll and or doing like certain jump cuts. So, um, you can see this one's like way zoomed in. So, uh, I, so it, I, a lot of times what I'll do is just so I can bear to look at it, I'll come in and just command C on the motion portion, which has posi position and scale programmed. And then once I have my video in place, I'll find the spots where that type of video, it actually is like pertains, like it's that shot and not the at desk shot. And I'll just come in and command V and, and place that there. So now the, it's all the right spot. You can see this one's actually the desk shot. So that's to go back to hundred percent. So yeah, I'm just going to like, try to in in one bulk kind of movement paste all that stuff on so i'll do like a b-roll and then i'll come through and i'll do my captions so i'll go back in change workspace and the next pass is captions and graphics so i'll find those graphics like if i'm talking about like hey three ways to you know learn web design or something i'm gonna already on the timeline i'll, I'll probably have already had this graphic or this um this caption size down correctly and position correctly to be like whatever the lesson title is or the chapter title is. And then what I love about Mogert's is like, it makes it super easy to edit them. So if I have this one here, this could be like, you know, number one, you know, like color inside of like web design. And then I'm just going through and I am finding the spots where like the titles go. So I'm grabbing that and I'm just holding down option and dragging it to the next section. And that's a really bad spot because you can't see it, obviously, in this example. But I would find the section that it actually lives. Sure. Um, and then I would change the title inside of the captions thing. So I'm just going to go back and take a pass and do all of the captions. Um, and then I'm going to actually like knuckle down and do color correction. So one of the things we didn't do and I don't have time to do right now because it'll take a little bit is to create that teal and orange like um, um, actual like color correction layer that sits on top of everything. You could do it really quick by just coming in here um, and doing a boom. We're going to make transparent video. We're going to bring that up, lay that on top. And then all you have to do is go to color and move up to your color settings. And so you could do like uh, as soon as I do color, like all my Lumetri scopes and everything open up. Um, I'm going to focus mainly like I leave a lot of like the levels and, you know, the whites, the blacks, all that stuff for the clips themselves, because those are all Again, I'm, I have the the pleasure or the benefit of shooting pretty consistently in a con controlled space. Mm. So I'm just going to make this um, this color block that sits on top of everything, that teal and orange layer, which means I'm going to come in and I'm going to find like the shadows, the midtones and the highlights. And this happens in the color wheels and match section. And I'm just going to move them up a little bit into like the orange for the shadows and the midtones. And then for the highlights, I drop them down a little bit into the blue. And then sometimes some people want to do a little bit of the color correction here as well, but you can see we can get like, like real drastic maybe or whatever. And then I would just have that and lengthen it and place it over any of the sections where it belongs. And then color correction all, also means coming into my actual clips here and doing the color correction there. Um, so you're, and, so you're typically doing that first, um, to color, correct, color balance, everything. And then you're yeah. adding that LUT on top as yes. sort of that final creative choice. 
Yep. Yep. It's that. And really it's, it's so that no matter like if I changed all the led lighting in my office, or maybe like the light was different, I was filming in the morning versus the evening and there's different amounts of light or whatever coming in, it brings like this kind of consistency to all my videos. So again, at scale, I want people to say like all his videos look really consistent. All they cool. always do. And so cool. you can do that per clip per actual piece of video, but adding like a master like layer on top of everything it's so subtle. Some might even say it doesn't matter. You don't need it. But there's this little part of me that that tells myself like, it's nice. People appreciate it. So I just yep. keep doing it. <laughs> so I'll do that color and then I'll come back and export. Um, but again, this is the spot where uh, after I'm done um, actually exporting everything, um, I'm going to like export this video out. I usually open up Media Encoder and let that run and export the video for me. And then while I'm doing that, I'm going to come back in and just if there's any massive change here, like, oh, you know what? I started using a different title or maybe this was that one time per quarter or year where I swapped out the video or the music. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do a little bit of extra work here. I'm going to take that five minutes and just peel things away by duplicating the sequence that I was just working on. Um, do, 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 this template that I was working on, I'm just going to duplicate it and I'm going to call this like template new and I'll go back into template new and rip out all the stuff that doesn't belong there that I don't want there do I don't want it on the timeline when I open it up next time. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Awesome. And that's, wow. that's really like, that's the entirety of the process. I know. I feel like I blazed through the editing process and, and there's well, probably I feel a lot like, more that could be talked about more like there. Well, I feel like we could, I feel like we could certainly talk for, for hours about like the editing process, your process. Um, but I feel like just having you here, having you go through how to actually set something up, it's not as daunting as I think a lot of people may think um, to just have this template in place, have something and really right here inside of Premiere Pro using Mogerts that were either pulled from Adobe Stock, pulled from somewhere else, whether it's like a motion array or some other some other platform. But Adobe Stock has some amazing templates that clearly you've used to create these templates. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then you see, I just I literally just saved the template out. I'm going to make sure that it's in my it's in my project. And this is probably this like could be a template folder or like I said, you can notice like in my videos, each of my videos are are organized by like date, like when they happen. But when you click in, like you'll see there's there's the project that was the template file. So my process is come into my new folder. Here's my template or like my new template. I'm just going to like these are all kind of created in advance. So like, hey, I'm going to be doing this video. So all I'm doing is taking it and just dragging it in hmm. like inside the project. And now I have a project or a, a template to work from. I just cool. rename it, rename the sequence inside and walk through everything we just did. Um, but it just, man, it's such a time saver. It's like off and away to the races as soon as I open up Premiere. And it's it's just been super helpful to me. Wow, that's amazing. Um, Annika had a question for you before we uh, kind of wind down here. How many times should you check the edited video when you're sending it to a client? Um, I think that's a great, a great question. Yeah. So uh, I, I mean, obviously, I'm watching it back like a lot of times as I'm playing back through everything, um, uh, especially during that polish uh, portion, of, like my timeline polish. I, I'm really watching through the video, uh, probably in fast forward, like two or three times fast forward. Um, to make sure nothing is weird, like I messed up and then stopped and did it again. I don't want any of those. So I'm watching it back plenty during edit. When I export, I'm I'm gonna scrub through it again and like watch through the whole thing again. But I definitely watch it all the way through. I don't scrub it all. I watch the entire thing once I upload it to YouTube. There's something about once you upload it to the platform that I've noticed like I catch more mistakes than anything once mm -hmm. I do that. Mm -hmm. So I make sure that I upload I put the title in, that's it. And I press save. I don't put any of the details. I don't waste the time yet because I'm going to, I'm usually batch uploading like four videos. So I'm uploading all of them, titling them and saving them. And then I go back through and now I'm doing other things. I'm preparing stuff, but I'm watching it in the background right here. And gotcha. sometimes I'll catch like a mess up and I go, uh oh, uh oh, good thing I didn't spend all the time putting in the description and the tags and everything for that. Delete that video, pull it down. I go back and fix it and re upload. Gotcha. So, Gotcha. Similar to like, uh, there, there's something very different from um, like designing like a poster if you're like a graphic designer and seeing it on your screen versus printing it out and going like, that doesn't, that's not quite right. Or right. like designing an app. I do a lot of like mobile UI design. You can look at it in your design software, but the minute you like in Adobe XD, mirror it onto your device, you go, 
gosh, that looks awful once it's actually yeah. on the medium in which I like intended it to be on. It's the same thing on YouTube. It's like gotcha. upload it, watch it there. Cool. Yeah, that's 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 great advice. And and um yeah, I just I feel like it you can never be too sure that something's not gonna go wrong. And the last thing you need is uh this amazing video to go up and there be a an issue in there that people call out and add in the comments uh for yourself or for the clients. So because yeah. once you um, upload, uh you really should keep it up. Yeah, <laughs> really should absolutely. leave it up. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, Jesse, I know we're we're kind of running a little bit low on time here. Um, I uh, had a pleasure hosting you today and, and learned so much from uh, your process inside of Premiere Pro to your process in general to create the content you create at scale almost every day. So again, for those in the chat who do not know Jesse Showalter, uh, first of all, what are you doing? His YouTube is linked here in the chat. Uh, he's over on Behance. Go give him a follow. Just uh, say hello, check out this video if you missed it. Um, and before we wrap up here, just a couple housekeeping items as we want to make sure we all are up to date. Uh, if you would like to nominate yourself or someone to be a guest on Adobe Live, please do submit those recommendations uh, for creatives in the tab on Behance. We love having new creatives on the show. Uh, it's a pleasure to just learn from everyone uh, out there in the community. And uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think we're about to wrap up here. Uh, make sure that you stay tuned uh, after Evan Abrams and Kyle Hamrick are here to answer all your pressing After Effects problems live in Evan's new show, Motion Design Hotline. Uh, this week, they're creating animated collages. Very, very exciting. And learn how to combine different photos, shapes, and footage to produce pleasing animations. I watch all of Evan's shows because he's just a god in After Effects. So please check him out. Uh, and again, thank you, Jesse, so much for taking your time today. Uh, I hope to be on here with you again soon. And I will absolutely be subscribing to that channel today. Thank you. Stoked to be here. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Take care.